ever gotten a standing ovation anywhere before. I wish my mother was here. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you all so much. Um, Atlanta has been so fun already. I haven't spent a ton of time here, but um, I've been excited to kind of tour around today and meet other people that are participating and all of y'all. So thank you for having me. Of course. Thanks for being here. Um, it's so funny reading someone's like full bio. I kind of enjoy it because it's like, when else are you going to hear all of this information about someone? Um, okay. So can you tell us a little bit more about Detroit Blows? How did, what's the origin story? Why did you even start this company? Yeah, you know, I was living and working in New York at Viacom and even listening to you, um, you know, say some of those things, it feels like forever ago because that's what happens in entrepreneurship. You dive in and a month feels like a year. <laughs> so our business has only been open for 18 months in Detroit, but my preceding time was at Viacom and as you mentioned, overseeing strategic partnerships, social impact. And so what does that mean? So we're mainly ad supported cable. and so all the um, automotive companies, consumer packaged goods companies, all these big brands that advertise on our networks, we also have a responsibility and an, an opportunity to really engage them in more meaningful work in the community that resonates with our audience members. And a lot of that was happening in Detroit, and it was happening at a time when um, I felt very sad to be away from Detroit. The economic downturn, the mortgage crisis, it affected everywhere across the country, but Detroit was definitely one of those markets that was hit the hardest with an industry that was starting to fail and also um, a mortgage crisis that for a city that was so expansive um, certainly hit harder. And in that, um, in the context of our advertising relationships, like one being with General Motors, they were trying to figure out how they can engage young employees in the workforce, how they can get people to want to live in Detroit at a time when everything that you read about Detroit is how the companies are failing, the houses are being burnt out, you can buy a house for a, a dollar, move there, and that really creates, I think, um, a lot of like identity and, and self-worth issues. And I was traveling back from New York to Detroit, and you know, my hair would be in a top knot, as one of my business partners likes to say. I'd get off the plane, and I'd have to figure out where I could go and get my hair blown out, and like, you know, pull it together to go into these big automotive companies to talk to them about how what we really needed to do now more than ever was double down on our commitment to Detroit, reinvest in the community, and really um, invest in. Um, and systems and programming, um, you know, and real estate opportunities that were going to make it feel more livable. But the hypocrisy of what I was doing wasn't lost on me because I was landing in Detroit and asking where I could go because I had been away for almost a decade, going out to the suburbs, getting my hair blown out, coming back, and then getting into a boardroom and having a conversation about how what we really needed to do was keep our dollars in the community. And so you do that enough times and you start to think, okay, well, there's got to be a different way. And so the thing that's so great about Detroit is you can solve problems. You can come up with an idea, talk to enough people, launch it, and then it's there. And there's not a lot of places where you can still do that. Although in the time I've spent here in Atlanta, um, I've been in the West End and in the Old Fourth Ward, and I just, I've been a, a lot of places today talking to people, and it, it, I'm feeling that vibe, and so it's so fun that you guys are doing this, and all the people that I've had an opportunity to meet, that energy feels really similar to what was going on in Detroit at the time. And there were some women that we met that had an idea for a blow dry bar, and I said, great, like, we would love to write you a check, we want to figure out how we can be involved, and then one started a business and one had a baby and as the story goes you find out that you're right back at the beginning of it a good idea but you don't really have kind of the wherewithal the energy like really the skill set sometimes to launch a new business and so i grappled with that for a while but what i understood we had was a really important story a story about redefining a great american city one that people felt was down and out, but really provided an incredible way to use space and to innovate. And when I started to also delve into it, I wanted to make sure that I could solve for an experience that I didn't have other places, which for me, I've spent you know my entire life going into salons and people looking at me and saying, well, let, we've just got to see if we have someone here that can do your hair 
or we can do your hair, but it's gonna take us a little longer, so we just wanna make sure that you're comfortable and can afford the price differential for the service that we would have to offer. And all of these tiny microaggressions really also, if you let it, and even if you try not to, but on some level it does great, again, at that underlying um, kind of sense of, of self. And so when we thought about doing this, the thing that really drove me towards it is this, not just this desire to build this business, but feeling like nobody was gonna do it the way that I was going to do it with my partners. Mm -hmm. um, one of my partners, um, you know, it's Italian, Canadian, um, another one biracial. And really, as we were looking around at each other and like really going back and thinking about the different experiences that we had had in salons, oftentimes in salons together, you know, these tiny little microaggressions, these thinly coated, ways in which systems and industries like beauty continue to perpetuate racism and it felt like activism. So there was an urgency around what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And that was really kind of the genesis for how we ended up back in Detroit. Wow, that's awesome. Oh, gosh, so many cool things. Okay, you just, you were going this direction. Can you tell us a little bit more about beauty as activism and what does that mean for you and how is that showing up in your business model? Yeah, it's interesting because in the entertainment space, I, I came to it as an, an activist, really thinking about the impact that we can have. And it goes back to identity and representation politics and what you see on screen and who gets to program those spaces and how we feel when we watch them. And defining what beauty is, you know, is an, an entire industry. It's everything from the products that are available to how we market them to the personal invitations via marketing advertising that we send to the consumer. And when you grow up and you see that none of this feels like it's for you, or then it, when you can start to, you know, find products and services that do feel like they're tailored towards you, it's one part of you, um, it, it starts to, to feel like there has to be some nuance and there has to be um, an opportunity for true inclusive beauty. And for us, we really pride ourselves on non-toxic beauty, but making sure that it's intersectional, making sure that it's inclusive. You know, salons have traditionally been these segregated spaces and you know, frankly, like you have the black people that wanna to go to the black salon and you have like white girls that wanna to go to their salon and Persian girls to their salon and so on and so forth. And frankly, it's because we wanna be in a scenario where we feel comfortable, sure. but where is the opportunity in terms of space, in terms of the talent that works with you and the conditions in which you're trying to make space for to create a scenario where we're not self-identifying and self-segregating into these different models because we're doing kind of what's best for us, but where's the opportunity to really know that we can go into one salon footprint and that the expectation of the service is that someone there is going to be able to do my hair regardless of where my grandmother is from or where my dad is from or whatever the case may be. And we also knew that in doing that, it means from a training and talent development standpoint that just because you have stylists that have only been exposed to one texture of hair, doesn't mean that they're not a good fit for us. It allows us the opportunity to really train towards a variety of textures so that we surprise people when they come in the door. You know, sometimes if I'm at the desk, they're like, oh, like this is your spot, oh but can you guys do my hair? I'm like, I can do your hair. I, I can't do your hair, I can't do any hair. That's also how we got here. But somebody <laughs> here can do your hair. And so that feels like our very existence in the central business district in this area that is you know, really having a moment and all this development around us to be able to be on Library Street, to have a salon called Detroit Blows, it feels like a bit of activism every day when people come in the door and they see, okay, even in the changing landscape of what is Detroit and who gets to participate and is this gentrification and how do we see ourselves reflected in the success um, that Detroit is having now from an entrepreneurial standpoint, it is important that people walk in the door and that they see one of us and that they know that this is a safe haven and that we built this with you in mind, with this interaction in mind. Awesome, okay, so I wanna run with that, but also switch gears just a little bit to hear more about your um, 
just like your entrepreneurial journey also. And so I'm wondering, as you are pioneering this new thing in the beauty industry and the salon industry, what was your journey to investment like? If you can speak to that a little bit. Because I find that sometimes it's tricky when you're trying to do something that's actually new to communicate the value of that new thing to other people at times. Yeah, and my entire career before this had been in a corporate environment, and I was so used to the structure of it, and I understood that I was a first-time founder, and like, who would give me money? Um, my, one of my business partners, also my best friend, uh, she was the first one, Sophia, to write a check. I said, okay, let me sit down and build the strategy, but also build the story of what it is we want to build. And if it feels compelling enough that independent of me, you think it's a good idea, mm. if you write the first check, maybe some other people will follow. And I did that. We built it out. I gave it to her. And I said, I don't know if it will work, but maybe we should try. And she said, we have to. Like, she wrote a check and called some people that she knew, and we did a small friends and family round, and that was really what seeded our investment. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the challenges for us also was the reality of opening a business in a market like Detroit, Michigan, where winter is supposed to be three months, and now it's five months, because if anyone tells you global warming doesn't affect small businesses, like, it does. Like, these are issues that are, you know, systemic, and at every sort of layer of business and society that it affects you. And so we rushed a little bit. We opened in October. It probably, like, would have opened three months later, but we knew that we needed to open in October because we needed to get there before the snow came. And so we did and we pushed and we opened even frankly before we had finished raising all the money that we needed, uh, which is you know a conversation for another day, maybe a conversation for today. <laughs> but I think what we learned is that you wanna make sure that you have someone that believes in you that starts it off you go to your friends and family, like that's great, but there's all different sorts of lessons that you'll learn in terms of how to raise money. If it makes sense to do convertible debt, do you have a business that's able to um, meet those debt and interest requirements like as you're ramping up? Like that was an interesting conversation for us as we opened three months earlier than I would have liked to and sure. the last bit of money that we didn't finish raising was our working capital. So what does that mean when you don't fully raise the money that you need, it means that you're making up the difference. And those are realities of a funding and financing um, standpoint that really make you think about and God bless you, think about um, how you raise the money and what kind of money you raise and how expensive different people's money is. And so, you know, it was really scrappy. And for us, it was mainly testing an idea, testing a theory. Yeah. And then it grew very quickly. And what we found is that there were a lot of people that were rooting for Detroit and we became something that they could root for. Mm. I think there were a lot of people that were rooting for um, not just non-toxic beauty because we're starting to have that, but like truly non-toxic inclusive beauty. What does beauty look like from a community revitalization standpoint? You know, part of our business is that we um, have a reinvestment arm and what does it look like for business to have a true role in the community where the economics of how you're making money are helping to fund the work that you're able to do and how you give back. And I think because of all of those things, um, people were willing to take a risk on first time founders that we're very grateful for. But I think we learned a lot along the way during those fundraising activities and now as we kind of move forward into this next phase that all money's not created equal, and some things that you think you can hold off on and will happen later are important to your sanity, to your daily operations, to making sure that you are creating a work environment where people are happy and healthy and that you can stabilize and grow at the same time. Great, okay, so um, in talking, there are two things that you just said that I wanna lean into more. I find that one of the biggest challenges new startups face is recruiting and retaining good talent. And so can you tell me about what that looks like for your company, finding the right people, and then once you find them, how do you keep them on board? Yeah, it's interesting because our model really started as a blowout model, and that was and still continues to be our core business. 
But what we've also had to do, understanding that the density of a market like Detroit is also very different than a New York or a LA or a Chicago, and you understand that you have people that work on our team, but they also supplement their income by being at fuller service salons because we don't quite have that. Uh, we have a nine to five, like 40 hour work week type of density in the central business district in Detroit. What we are just starting to achieve is um, kind of that 24 hour culture where you can go outside and do anything and there's an expectation that there are service businesses that are open to you as well. And so as we scale into that, what we've had to do is our business has really had to respond to the desire of our clients and also like what the market has asked for as well. And we've had to increase some of our services. So while we primarily are blowouts, we also have non-toxic uh, makeup, waxing. We're in the process of um, taking a look at some color lines. Um, and what, what this has essentially done is it's created a scenario where people that may be at our salon and a full service salon can start to see where there's an opportunity for them to generate more wealth and not necessarily have the desire to move to other salon environments or work there less days a week and with us more days a week. And so for us, we've really had to balance what clients have asked for and what our team members say um, you know, they need in terms of a, a working environment and really tried to figure out how to meet in the middle. Um, we have less turnover than the salons generally have or these blow dry salons generally have and it's probably a little closer, although not yet approaching kind of a booth rental commission model where those are really entrepreneurs inside of an entrepreneurial footprint. So I think that we're a little closer to the middle, but part of it has really been a safe place for people to land and a feeling that what we do is different than what they experience in, in other scenarios. And it's training and talent development and really being inclusive and trying to offer opportunities for continuing education in the non-toxic beauty space, which is a definitely like a growth sector in terms of beauty in general. And I think that they also get excited about the people outside of Detroit that are rooting for them. And last December, we got a call from a, a good friend, Peter Tunney, who is a pop artist. I actually had breakfast with him the morning that Detroit filed for bankruptcy. This was years ago, maybe eight years now. And he slid the, the times across the table and he's like, have you seen this? And I said, no, and I was just devastated, like as you certainly would be. But last December, I got a call from Peter. He was making new work down in Miami for Basel. And he's like, I've been working on something for you. It'll be there before Christmas. And then this huge, like six foot by six foot canvas that says Detroit Blows that he's spent the past like eight years creating and gathering different like um, different cutouts and clippings and old magazines and you know it's like the Good Morning Detroit crew and Aaliyah and just everyone that you can imagine that's sort of an amalgamation of Detroit this beautiful piece of art that he sent to the salon and he said I just want you guys to know that people out there that you that the girls don't even know are rooting for them and that's the kind of thing that makes people want to get up and come to work um, and it feels much bigger than, you know, than just the salon. So we always say beyond the blowout, but for us, it's always been about what happens um, outside of the salon and how the, the story is able to travel and our team members can be connected to it. And they feel that when they come in the door every day. Wow. It sounds like in, in many ways, you are a part of an incredible community of people, like even that he would take the time to create that for you and for the, the women who work with you and for you. Um, if there are people in this room who are struggling to find that sort of community or struggling to find people who believe in them, do you, I didn't prep you with this question, but what um, words of encouragement would you offer? Because I know that entrepreneurship can also be a really lonely journey. It can, and I benefited greatly from people who helped me. And I don't mean like writing checks, although there were some that did, but people that picked up the phone when I had questions and um, who I was sometimes afraid to, to ask for help. But if entrepreneurship teaches you anything, like it's truly humility. 
And you know, we function as a social enterprise. A, a dollar from every blowout, a portion of our retail footprint flows into our nonprofit. And I remember that early on in my career, I had um, an executive at the company that said, well, do you want to help people or do you want to make money? Like, do you want to make money or do you want to give money away? Like this, are you a nonprofit? Are you for profit? Are you for purpose? Are you for people? And I didn't, I understood that you could be all of those things and I wanted to build a business that was all of those things. But the most important thing that it gave me is even at a you know, very like entry level role, I was always philanthropic and thinking about how I could give something away or how I could help other people. Like my, one of my first bosses, Russell Simmons said, if you want to make money, help other people make money. So what I think is if you're looking for a community, think about if you had resources, who would you help? Think about skills-based volunteerism. What is the company that you're building or that you want to do? What, what is it that you could offer to other members of the community when you felt like you had enough time, that you had enough resources, or whatever the case may be? And I, I think that oftentimes you'll find your community around the network of individuals that also need your resources and support and help also. I met Sophia not as an actress, even though I worked in entertainment and she was in front of the camera. I met her at a social impact conference because I was so surprised that she's taking these like crazy copious notes. And I'm like, isn't that the girl from, she was on like One Tree Hill at the time. I was like, she looks like she is in it. <laughs> and I sat next to her and I was just so surprised. And until this day, she's always the person in the room that is taking notes, trying to figure out like how she can help somebody else. Mm -hmm. and, and both of our desires to learn more about how to impact systems and to have true kind of change, but from where we are, we met and have been best friends for a decade and then launched this business together. Yeah. And so I really think that if you can figure out how to help people and not be afraid to do that, those types of experiences I think often lead you to people that can end up being your network and your support as well. Wow, that's so good. I love that. And um, so in thinking about generosity, which is what I feel like you just described, um, can you tell us more about Detroit Groves? You've alluded to it, but can you like lay that out for the people? What is it? Why is it? Tell us more. Yeah, I love a pun also. So <laughs> we're always like, well, when Detroit blows, Detroit grows. And that was a lot of how we spoke of it from, uh, you know, the, the early days. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have... Lots of friends, um, our friends have like Warby Parker and Tom's and these really interesting give back models. And we wanted to figure out also that as we scale a business, how can we reinvest in a way that the business can support? And so for us, we knew that, um, you know, it would be a dollar from every blowout. It'd be a, a portion of our retail profits. And then what would we do with that money? Well, when I was at Viacom, one of my big clients was also the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We got to work on a lot of their education work here um, locally, um, global public health, internationally. But they're true proponents and believers in the multiplier effect. And it's this philanthropic reinvestment strategy that by investing in women and girls and communities, the money actually goes further because you're investing in their families. You're investing in their the ideas that they breathe into the world. And we, we loved that and we were touched by that. And so we said, okay, Detroit Goes is gonna reinvest in women and girls in the community, but what does that look like? And so we've segmented it into two types of giving. So the, the grant-based giving to other nonprofits are nonprofits that work on eliminating, uh, eliminating barriers to entry for women or girls that are trying to enter or re-enter the workforce. So. Right. That could be everything from homelessness to domestic abuse to sex, sex trafficking. Um, there's a myriad of issues of which there are really incredible organizations that are working on them. Um, and our like, very specific um, directed grants go towards supporting women in those ecosystems that might have some desire for uh, the some sort of a role in cosmetology so that in addition to whatever grant-based support we can offer for these individuals, there's also the opportunity for them to come in and to really learn about the business mm -hmm. and to understand that, yes, what you can look at and see is a single you know, salon business in Detroit, but do you understand the product space? Do you understand the, the real estate play? Do you, do you begin to understand the ecosystem of things around you? And there's so many different things that 
you could do that could be of interest to you, and maybe you just haven't had the opportunity to really delve in, and is there then an opportunity for us to bring additional relationships or resources to bear on an individual level um, that help with the career journeys of, of those women? And so that's on the grant making side. And the other is just entrepreneurship. I mean, because it's hard. and even grant competitions that we were participating in, like it took all the degrees between us to try and figure out how to fill this stuff out. And like sometimes you win and sometimes you don't and it can be very discouraging. And I just remember thinking, sometimes it's a lot of hoops to jump through for a smaller amount of money. And at Viacom, I could write million dollar checks and that was great, but what does a thousand dollars do? What does $10,000 do? And so we've really started to dive in and we, I don't, know if I'm supposed to talk about it yet, but we're announcing um, a partnership with Bumble Biz this week, I believe. And we will, via the app, essentially be launching a, an entrepreneurship competition where then we'll be able to select, you know, three women who have businesses in Detroit that are benefiting the community to come in and essentially pitch for, you know, for funds. And starting to really think about what type of social kind of networking and entrepreneurial ecosystem that we were able to tap into that we can leverage for these businesses. Because it's like we might not be able to fund the opening of a restaurant and write like a check for 500,000, but for five grand if you need a commercial oven, like which was the case for someone that um, we've come across, like that's something that maybe we can help out with. And that makes a world of difference in terms of someone being able to realize a dream and a vision where then maybe, you know, six months from them when they have, you know, financials and they're able to begin to think about how to model what a business could actually look like because they have the, um, you know, the, the asset, the, the piece of equipment that really enables that business. It, that is how people realistically on the ground get to the next phase who might not have the immediate resources or the proven model that allow them to go after larger buckets of money. So we really wanted to think about how we could enable entrepreneurs really like on a micro level. Yeah. If people want to learn more, I have, this is a quick question, then I have my last question. Um, if people want to learn more about Detroit Grows and ways that they can support you, I know we're here in Atlanta, but are there things that the general public can do to be a part of what you're building there? Yeah, I mean, it's help us, especially as we think about other markets that could be interesting for us. Tell us about what's going on in your city. Do you, if you have something cool that's happening here that maybe there's a version of it in Detroit that we should check into, someone that, you know, or some organization that has best practices, like wherever you are, we always love to learn more about that. Um, we've built Detroit Grows to be sustainable in the context of our business model, but we've always had generous benefactors that have come and have experienced what happens in the salon and have wanted to like make a donation and that just allows us to continue to give more you know resources out into the community or any ideas of um, resources digital or otherwise that could scale to the Detroit community that we might be able to offer to some of our grantees sometimes it's just that we don't know about all the things that we can and resources that we could connect them to mm -hmm. Because again, we're first time entrepreneurs, been at it for under two years, but people that are really ingrained in the community and have, you know, created multiple businesses know like, well, here's the resource for someone to begin to try and do some financial uh, performa modeling or things that we can pass on, I think are always really helpful because we want to continue to make sure that we can be in service to our grantees beyond, you know, the financial grant. Awesome. Okay. Um, okay, last question, and then at the end, after our next presenter, we'll have a chance to ask all of our presenters questions. Um, so if you have one, jot it down, don't forget it. But my last question for you is, what is one thing you wish you knew when you started? Um, I don't know if it's something I wish I knew because it's something that I knew, but it's maybe um, advice that I didn't heed as much as I should have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, two of our investors, and we have, an awesome investor pool. 70% of our investors are women, which I think is just so dope because often when you people generate wealth, like we always say that men are asked to invest in businesses and women are asked to donate money. And mm. this was a really interesting opportunity where it was a hybrid, but 70% of our investors are women and I love that. 
Um, two of those women uh, are global heads of HR or have been for Fortune 100 companies, and they told me, your entire job is going to be HR. Do you know that? And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm going to be like trying to meet with different entrepreneurs and like brand building and like designing merch. And they're like, no, it's going to be all HR. And I still get to do some of that stuff, but literally only when I'm not doing HR. Mm -hmm. And so for a service-based business and understanding that people really drive our organization, I wish I had really understood that from the beginning and kind of made space from an operational standpoint for that. Um, or frankly, written into the budget some resources to really help with the HR elements of the business so that I could focus more on the cultural aspects of it. Mm -hmm. But if you have a business, like many of us I'm sure do, that really rely on the people that make it special, like continue to overinvest in them and make sure that that doesn't just look like financial resources, but it also looks like your time and, and energy because you will spend it anyway, so you might as well be prepared for it. Wow, that's so good. That's really great. Thank you so much for your time, your story, for the work that you're doing, and for sharing it with all of us. Let's give it up for Thank Nia. Thank you.